morning of May 25, 1979, was hectic at the New York City home of Stanley and Julie Patz. They lived in a converted loft in Manhattan's Soho district, pioneers in a section of the city that would later become the place to be for New York trendsetters. Soho had been Manhattan's manufacturing zone, characterized by block after block of 19th century, iron-fronted factories standing shoulder to shoulder. On overcast days, it was easy to imagine the gloomy sweatshop conditions of old New York. But in the 1970s, a fair number of these buildings were dark and empty, and the streets were desolate and forbidding at night. Still, people were making their homes in the neighborhood, breathing new life into it. Artists were first drawn to the area, attracted to the large open spaces and cheap rents. Stanley Patz, a photographer, and his wife Julie, lived in a loft on Prince Street with their three children, Shira, then age eight, Eaton, six, and Airy, two. Julie ran a daycare center out of her home. On the morning of May 25th, as was her routine, Julie got her own children ready for the day as she prepared for the 14 preschoolers she cared for. As Julie dished out breakfast for her family, Little Eaton started agitating to walk himself to the bus stop again. He'd been asking if he could for some time now. A six-week school bus strike had just ended. The buses were scheduled to resume service that day. During the strike, the Patses had hired a woman to walk Eaton to school. But now that the buses were back, Eaton pleaded with his parents to let him walk the two blocks to the bus stop by himself. Eaton was a good boy, and it was a close-knit neighborhood where the residents watched out for the children, so the Patses gave in and told him he could walk to the bus stop like a big boy. Eaton was elated. He dressed all in blue that day, blue pants, blue corduroy jacket, and blue sneakers with distinctive fluorescent stripes along the sides. He carried a blue cloth bag with an elephant pattern on the fabric. And as usual, he was wearing his black Future Flight Captain pilot's cap, which covered his straight, light brown hair. He pulled it down low over his brow, shading his blue eyes. He wore his prized cap all the time, even to bed. He'd bought it at an outdoor flea market for 10 cents. Julie took Eaton downstairs to the street and gave him a dollar for a soft drink at the local bodega. It was a misty morning and the pavement was wet. Julie watched Eaton as he started his big journey, two short blocks to the corner of Prince and West Broadway, where the bus would pick him up. She kept her eye on him as he proceeded to the first corner at Wooster Street. After he crossed, Julie went back upstairs, confident that Eaton could make it the rest of the way by himself. It was just 150 feet to the bus stop. A woman who lived nearby saw Eaton as he stood on the corner of Wooster and Prince, a relatively quiet intersection, as he waited to cross. A mailman also saw him at that intersection. They were the last people known to see Eaton Pats. The school bus arrived at the West Broadway stop at 8.10 a.m. A group of children got on, but Eaton Pats wasn't with them. Later that morning, at the Independence Plaza School on Greenwich Street, Eaton's first grade teacher noticed his absence, but failed to report it to the principal's office. Julie Pats was unaware that her son was missing until that afternoon. The bus returned to the West Broadway stop at 3.15 p.m. The neighbor who always picked up Eaton along with his own daughter was puzzled when Eaton didn't get off the bus. His daughter informed him that Eaton hadn't been in school that day. The man wondered why Julie or Stanley hadn't called to let him know that Eaton was staying home that day. At the Pats's loft, Julie was beginning to worry. Eaton should have been home by now. She called the neighbor who usually escorted Eaton and learned for the first time that Eaton hadn't been in school that day. Julie immediately called the police, then called her husband who raced home. NYPD detective William Butler got the call from his dispatcher at 5.15 p.m., and he and his partner drove directly to the Patz's loft. As soon as Detective Butler spoke to Eaton's parents, he knew instinctively that this was not a typical lost child situation. In most cases, it's just a case of cross signals, kids thinking they have their parents' permission to go to a friend's house when they really don't. Other kids just wander off and play hooky, but Butler felt this case was different. The search for Eaton Pats began that evening. Nearly 100 officers combed the area, knocking on doors, searching rooftops and basements. The Pats's apartment was used as a temporary command post because Eaton knew his phone number. Julie and Stanley hovered by the phone, praying for him to call. The police stood by in case a kidnapper called with a ransom demand. The night wore on, 
just before midnight, it started to rain. Julie fretted because Eaton had left that morning with only a light jacket. Detective Butler quietly worried that the rain would wash away Eaton's scent. Bloodhounds were being brought in from upstate, but they weren't scheduled to arrive until 8 a.m. He hoped there'd be something left for the hounds to smell. The next morning, when the bloodhounds finally arrived, they were given a pair of Eaton's pajamas to identify their subject. Then they were sent out into the streets with their handlers. In the meantime, the search area was expanded to encompass the entire lower end of Manhattan, from 14th Street to Battery Park. Police helicopters hovered over the search zone, scanning rooftops. Police boats scoured the waterways. The police appealed to the public for any tip that could lead to the boys' whereabouts. Toll-free telephone numbers were set up, and calls started pouring in, some from as far away as California. Neighborhood residents helped in the search, papering the city with colored posters of Eaton's face. The media jumped on the story and propagated several erroneous leads regarding Eaton Pat's sightings in Boston and other places. On Sunday, May 27th, a witness came forward who claimed to have seen a boy who fit Eaton's description walking to a suspicious-looking man three blocks from the corner of Prince and Wooster Streets, where Julie had last seen her son. Under hypnosis, the witness described the man as white, about 40 years old, with freckles and dyed blonde hair. It was a tenuous lead because the witness wasn't sure if the boy she'd seen was actually Eaton Pats, but the police couldn't discount any possibility. For days it seemed that Eaton's smiling face was everywhere, on lamp poles, in store windows, in the newspapers, on television. The police continued the search, giving it everything they had. But on June 6, 13 days after he disappeared, the emergency response was terminated. Eaton Pats' disappearance remained an open case, but most of the officers who had taken part in the search were eventually reassigned to other cases. But for Detective Butler, Eaton's case was still very much on the front burner. Nearly every day he would drive down Prince Street at 8 a.m., imagining what might have happened to Eaton on the morning of May 25th, hoping that something would occur to him that he hadn't thought of before, that he would see something that would trigger an idea. He visited the scene every morning for years, and Julie Patz took comfort in looking out her window and seeing his car pass by. If the case was still active, Eaton might still be alive. But weeks turned into months, and months turned into years. Eaton became the first missing child to be featured on a milk carton. The search for the skinny, middle-aged blonde man with freckles was ultimately fruitless. It wasn't until 1982 that detectives in the Bronx picked up a suspect in an unrelated crime and stumbled upon a solid lead. The suspect was a known file. Jose Antonio Ramos was a drifter who sold cheap jewelry and small toys on the street to get by. His graying hair was long and unkempt, and his beard hung down to his chest. He weighed 180 pounds and stood 5 feet 9 inches. His posture was hunched. Despite his off-putting appearance, his voice was unusually soothing and gentle. NYPD officers arrested him in 1982 for allegedly attempting to lure two young boys into the drainage tunnel where he'd been living. In searching the tunnel, the police found several photographs of young boys, most of them with light-colored hair similar to Eaton's. Detectives questioned Ramos about his interest in young boys and asked if he knew anything about Eaton Pats. He denied knowing anything about the missing child, but he did say that he knew the woman who had walked Eaton to the bus stop every morning during the school bus strike. The detectives proceeded cautiously. Could it be possible that, after all this time, they had stumbled upon the first solid lead in the coldest missing persons case the city had ever seen? They urged Ramos to explain his relationship with the woman who had worked for the Pats family, but the suspect was cautious himself. He refused to say any more about the woman. He did, however, reveal that in 1979, when Eaton had disappeared, he had suffered a nervous breakdown and that he had been hearing a voice in his head. It would try to force me to get violent, he said. I had to hold it back, he said during a videotaped interrogation. I had to do a lot of really forceful holding back, you know, because I was, I was ready to explode. Ramos said nothing more about Eaton Pats. Detectives tracked down the woman who had been hired to walk Eaton to the bus stop during the strike. The woman admitted that she had been seeing Ramos in 1979. At the time, Ramos had been renting an apartment on the Lower East Side. She broke down in tears when she revealed that Ramos' interest in her was just a ploy to get to her young son whom he had molested on several occasions. 
she never attempted to bring charges against Ramos. Ramos was clearly a dangerous individual, but the police didn't have enough evidence to charge him with a crime. They had no choice but to release him. Three years later, in 1985, federal prosecutor Stuart Grabois was assigned to the Pats case. His boss at the time, then U.S. Attorney Rudy Giuliani, instructed him to do whatever it took to get a conviction, and Giuliani promised to give Grabois whatever he needed to make that happen. Grabois started poring over the old files. When he read the police reports on Ramos, he decided the man deserved further investigation. By this time, Ramos was incarcerated at Rockview State Penitentiary in Pennsylvania, serving a sentence on an unrelated child molestation conviction. Grabois arranged to have Ramos brought to New York for questioning, and U.S. Marshals escorted the suspect to Grabois's office in Lower Manhattan. Oddly, when Ramos was brought to New York, he thought the authorities there were after him for tax evasion. Two detectives from the NYPD Missing Persons Squad, Robert Shaw and Daniel Cavallo, sat in on the interview. Ramos was read his Miranda rights and offered a lawyer if he wanted one. He declined, saying that he didn't need a lawyer. He had read up on criminal law while in prison and became a jailhouse lawyer, offering legal advice to other inmates at Rockview. Ramos was in good spirits as the interview began. Apparently, he was looking forward to matching wits with a real attorney. Grabois was patient. For an hour and a half, he questioned Ramos about his background, his childhood, and his prison experiences. Ramos remained cool and seemed to enjoy the attention. Then Grabois finally dropped the bomb. How many times did you have sex with Eaton Pats? He asked. Ramos's face sagged. He was visibly rattled. As reported by Edward Klein in Vanity Fair, Ramos started to sob. I'll tell you about it, he said. I'll tell you everything. I never told anyone any of this before. I want to get it off my chest. Ramos said he saw a boy who fit Eaton Pats' description in Washington Square Park in Greenwich Village that morning. The boy was alone, bouncing a ball. The park is roughly four city blocks north of the Pats' home in Soho. Grabois asked him what the boy looked like. Blonde and blue-eyed, Ramos said. He then described Eaton's distinctive blue sneakers with the bright strips. Ramos said he invited the boy to his apartment to watch television. Grabois asked Ramos why he wanted the boy to go with him. For sex, Ramos said. Ramos described his attempts to molest the boy, but the boy wasn't interested, so Ramos gave up. He said he then took the boy for a walk through the village and finally put him on a subway to visit his aunt in Washington Heights. The Patses have no relatives in Washington Heights. Grabois and his detectives expressed their disbelief, but Ramos clung to his story. He said that the next night he saw television news reports on the search for Eaton Pats, and he was 90% sure that this was the boy he had taken to his apartment. Ramos claimed that he left his apartment and tried to help in the search for Eaton himself. In his gut, Grabois felt that Ramos had not parted company with Eaton Pats at the subway stop, as he claimed and that Ramos was responsible for what happened to the boy. If Ramos hadn't murdered the boy to eliminate a witness to his pedophilia, he might have sold Eaton to another child molester or an illegal adoption broker. Grabois pressed Ramos to come clean, but the man wouldn't say anything more about Eaton Pats. He finally said that he wanted to tell Grabois everything, but maybe I better have a lawyer here. By law, Grabois had to terminate the interrogation until Ramos was provided legal representation. Later, as the suspect was escorted out of Grabois' office, Ramos told Detective Shaw that when he finally told them everything, Shaw would get a promotion and become famous. Investigators had connected Jose Antonio Ramos, a convicted file, to the Eaton Pats case. But it wasn't until 2004, 25 years after Eaton vanished, that a New York judge ruled Ramos responsible for Eaton's death. Jose Antonio Ramos never made a full confession. In subsequent interrogations, he flitted around the issue but basically stuck to his original story. He had taken a young boy who might have been Eaton Pats to his apartment for sex and released him later that day. The police and prosecutors handling the case were sure he was lying, but they had no proof. Charges could not be brought against him. But Stuart Grabois was not about to let Ramos serve out the remainder of his sentence in Pennsylvania and go free. The Pats family deserved to know what had happened to their son, and Grabois vowed to do everything he possibly could to bring Ramos to justice.
Ramos, a Puerto Rican American, was born in the Bronx on July 23, 1943. The oldest of five brothers, he claimed to have had sexual relations with one of his brothers when they were children. He also claimed to have been molested by an uncle. After dropping out of high school, he enlisted in the Navy in 1960. At various times, he's claimed to have received decorations and commendations in the Navy and is boasted of having held an executive position in a New York advertising firm, accomplishments that cannot be substantiated. By the early 1970s, he'd become a drifter, bumming his way around the country, earning money selling used merchandise on the streets. Over the years, he'd been arrested several times in several different states for a variety of crimes, from burglary and battery to exposing his person. When he was arrested in the Bronx in 1982, for allegedly luring young boys into his makeshift drainage tunnel residence. The police were unable to assemble enough evidence to bring charges, but five months later, he was arrested again, this time at a video game arcade in Times Square, for propositioning three young boys between the ages of 9 and 12. Charges were filed against Ramos, but were later dropped when the boys, all of them street-tough delinquents, failed to answer subpoenas for their testimony. In 1983, Ramos showed up outside Watersmeet, Michigan, were several thousand members of the Rainbow Family, a loose collective of hippie holdovers, New Agers, and assorted free spirits, were having their annual gathering. Ramos was observed handing out Star Wars figurines and trading cards to the children at the Convocation's Kid Village. His behavior alarmed some of the caregivers, and they alerted the Rainbow Family's internal security force, the Shanty Senna, who asked Ramos to leave. He departed without putting up a fuss. Two years later, he showed up at the Rainbow Family annual gathering at the Mark Twain Forest in Missouri. He was traveling with a light-haired teenage boy. They'd arrived in a 1978 Blue Ford school bus that Ramos had bought at an auction in Coconut Grove, Florida. Once again, Ramos was spotted hanging around Kid Village, handing out small toys and trinkets, and the Shanty Senna were immediately alerted. They remembered Ramos from their last encounter with him, and this time, they took his picture and kept an eye on him. While at the gathering, Ramos made friends with a couple from Erie, Pennsylvania, and their two little boys. After the Rainbow family reunion, Ramos showed up unannounced at this couple's home on several occasions. Whenever he came, he offered to do work around the house, painting, car repairs, whatever needed doing. The couple eventually trusted Ramos enough to let him babysit their boys while they were away for a day or so. They later discovered that Ramos had molested one or both of the children while they were under his care. Incredibly, the following year, Ramos and the teenage boy arrived at the next Rainbow Family Gathering at Heart's Content in Pennsylvania's Allegheny National Forest. Once again, the Shanty Senna caught him hanging around Kid Village, and this time they followed him back to his blue bus and banged on the door. Ramos was inside with his teenage friend and a little boy he'd met at the gathering. He swore he hadn't touched the child but the Shanty Senna didn't believe him. They photographed both him and the light-haired teenager and gave Ramos a stern warning to stay away from the children. At least one of the Shanty Senna was convinced that Ramos was scouting out children he could kidnap and sell. Sensing that they meant business, Ramos abandoned his companions and fled from the gathering with only his dog, an Akita named Jesse. But the Shanty Senna finally decided it was time to notify the police about this man. State troopers intercepted Ramos near Route 80 in Shippenville, Pennsylvania. He was arrested and charged with involuntary deviate sexual intercourse, statutory rape, and indecent assault. He confessed to assaulting the child in his bus, but because the police failed to read him his Miranda rights, the confession had to be thrown out and the case was dropped. Ramos went free, but not for long. The next year, he was convicted of molesting the two young boys in Erie, and sentenced to prison in Rockview State Penitentiary in Belafonte, Pennsylvania. His blue bus, which had been impounded by the police in Shippenville, was declared abandoned and sold to a salvage dealer who towed it away and cleaned out its contents. Among the items found in the bus was Ramos's diary. The man who found it flipped through it quickly, decided it was worthless, and tossed it into the fire where he was burning the rest of Ramos's trash. No one will ever know if Ramos had written anything that could have connected him to the disappearance of Eaton Pats. But what became of the light-haired teenage boy who had been traveling with Ramos? The Shanty Senna had noted in 1986 that he was about 13 or 14, which was about how old Eaton Pats would have been. Could this have been him? <laughs>
What happened to him after Ramos had fled the Rainbow family gathering? He's a predator. Federal Prosecutor Stuart Grabois had Ramos transported from prison in Pennsylvania to his office in New York for interviews on several occasions. Sometimes Ramos would be a wise-ass, once showing up wearing a yarmulke and speaking in a Yiddish accent. Other times he behaved himself, but he always clung to his original story. Yes, he admitted, he had been with a boy who could have been Eaton Pats the day Eaton disappeared, but he did not harm the boy. Ramos insisted time and again that he had put the boy on a subway headed for his aunt in Washington Heights. But when Grabois found out about the charges that were dropped in Warren County, Pennsylvania, on a technicality, he took a new tack. At one of the interviews, he made Ramos a solemn promise. If Ramos didn't start cooperating, Grabois would get himself deputized in the state of Pennsylvania and try that case himself. He wasn't bluffing. If he couldn't persuade Ramos to confess to what he had done with Eaton Pats, Grabois would make sure that Ramos would stay in prison for as long as the law allowed. Ramos was taken back to Rockview, and Grabois set the wheels in motion for his legal debut in Pennsylvania. While investigating the Warren County case, Grabois received a surprise assist from the members of the Shanty Senna, who had been alerted to Ramos's suspicious behavior at Rainbow Family Gatherings. Overcoming their counterculture distrust of law enforcement, the Shanty Senna gave Grabois the Polaroid they had taken of the teenager who had been traveling with Ramos. As soon as he saw it, Grabois was afraid to even think that after all these years, this could possibly be Eaton Pats. The photo was sent to FBI headquarters in Washington, D.C., where it was compared with photos of Eaton's parents when they were in their early teens, as well as photos of Eaton's siblings. Existing photos of six-year-old Eaton were fed into a computer that aged the image and predicted what Eaton would look like at age 14. The photo the computer produced was nearly identical to the Polaroid of the teenager who had been traveling with Ramos. Still, Grabois was reluctant to jump to conclusions. He had learned from the Shanty Senna that the teenager's parents ran an orphanage in Columbus, Ohio. Grabois and his investigators flew to Ohio and searched for this teenager. They learned that the boy had been adopted, which would have been a logical cover story if Ramos had sold Eaton to the owners of the orphanage. Grabois wanted to believe that this was indeed Eaton Pats, but he knew that he needed proof, and he was determined to get it. Before attempting an approach, Grabois wanted as much information as he could find. Further investigation revealed that the teenager had been arrested, which meant his fingerprints had to be on file in Ohio. Thrumming with anticipation, the investigators had the fingerprints analyzed and compared to Eaton's fingerprints. When the results came back, the news was disappointing. The fingerprints didn't match. Police finally approached the teenager and obtained samples for DNA analysis. Once again, no match. The teenager wasn't Eaton Pats. Nevertheless, Grabois pressed on with the Warren County case against Ramos. His investigators located the little boy who had been in the bus with Ramos at heart's content and discovered that he had, indeed, been molested by Ramos. Grabois figured that, even if he couldn't solve the Eaton Pats case, another conviction would keep Ramos off the streets that much longer, sparing more children from the man's abuse. The trial began in October 1990. Ramos, now clean-shaven and with short hair, spoke to reporters as if he were insane inviting them to a shrimp dinner at the jail that night. Ramos, the jailhouse lawyer, had already filed numerous motions with the court, and in a letter to the judge, he admitted his crime and asked that the child he had molested not be put through the anguish of having to relive the incident in court. The request was unnecessary. His attorney had already worked out a plea bargain with prosecutors, in which Ramos would plead guilty to oral intercourse if the charges of anal intercourse were dropped. Grabois agreed to the deal because he, like Ramos, did not want to put the boy through the turmoil of testimony in open court. The judge sentenced Ramos to 10 to 20 years on top of his existing sentence. It was the strictest sentence the law would allow. Some felt that Grabois had missed a golden opportunity to get Ramos on the stand and grill him about Eaton Pats, but Grabois didn't think that Ramos could be intimidated. Grabois' strategy was to pile so many years on top of Ramos that he might finally see the logic of coming clean. Grabois was willing to have him transferred to a more desirable federal penitentiary in exchange for the truth about Eaton Pats.
Grabois even sweetened the deal by offering to reunite Ramos with family members he hadn't seen in more than 18 years. But Ramos didn't budge from his original story, and so he was sent back to Rockview to serve hard time. Ramos was subsequently transferred to the Smithfield Correctional Institution in Huntingdon, Pennsylvania. Two inmates who had served time with Ramos over the years each swore that Ramos had separately told them details about Eaton Pats, but when confronted with these statements, Ramos insisted that he knew nothing more than he'd already admitted. In October 1985, the focus of the investigation shifted to Israel, where a previously unpublished photo of Eaton appeared in an Israeli magazine with the caption, Eaton Ben Haim. The photo had been taken by Stanley Patz, who had given prints to friends and relatives. It was not one of the photos that had been released to the press, which made the investigators suspicious. Stuart Grabois traveled to Israel and enlisted the help of the Israeli police, but attempts to track down the source of that photograph yielded nothing of substance. The focus of the investigation remained on Jose Ramos. In the summer of 2000, police in New York did a thorough search of the building on East 4th Street, on Manhattan's Lower East Side, where Ramos had lived in 1979. They scoured the apartment in the basement, looking for bone fragments that could be used for DNA analysis. Their efforts were exhaustive, but ultimately fruitless. He's a predator, Stanley Patz said of Ramos in an interview broadcast on 60 Minutes, and he should never be allowed to be near children again. He should be kept behind bars until he's too old to walk. Every year on October 9th, which is Eaton's birthday, and May 25th, the day he disappeared, Stanley Pat sends Ramos a copy of Eaton's missing persons leaflet. On the back, he always types the same message, What have you done with my little boy? On November 15, 2000, Stanley and Julie Pat signed a petition asking the court to declare Eaton legally dead so that they could file a wrongful death suit against Ramos. On May 24, 2010, New York Police Commissioner Raymond Kelly announced that a man was in custody who had implicated himself in Eaton's disappearance. According to the New York Times, a law enforcement official identified the man as 51-year-old Pedro Hernandez of Maple Shade, New Jersey, and said that he had confessed to strangling the child. He stated in his written confession to police, I'm sorry, I choke him. According to a 2009 book about the case, after Eaton, Eaton had a dollar and had told his parents he planned to buy a soda to drink with his lunch. At the time of Eaton's disappearance, Hernandez was an 18-year-old convenience store worker in a neighborhood bodega. Hernandez said that he later threw Eaton's remains into the garbage. Hernandez was charged with second-degree murder. According to a New York Times report from May 25, 2012, the police at that time had no physical evidence to corroborate his confession. On December 12, 2012, Hernandez pleaded not guilty to two counts of murder and one count of kidnapping in a New York court. In April 2013, Harvey Fishbane, Hernandez's legal aid criminal defense lawyer, filed a motion to dismiss the case, citing that Hernandez's confession in one of the nation's most notorious child disappearances was false, peppered with questionable claims, and made after almost seven hours of police questioning. The next month, however, New York Supreme Court Justice Maxwell Wiley ruled that the evidence was legally sufficient to support the charges and that the case could move forward. He also ordered a hearing to determine whether the defendant's statements could be used at trial. Hernandez had a hearing in September 2014 about whether his statements made prior to police giving him his Miranda rights were legally admissible at trial. This would be influenced by whether or not he felt free to leave during the time before he was informed of his Miranda rights. The hearing was also to determine whether or not he understood the significance of the Miranda rights and was competent to waive them when he did so. This was significant because it would decide whether any statements made after that point by Hernandez were legally admissible at trial. The actual truth or falsehood of the statements was not the focus of the hearing. Rather, the question of the statement's truthfulness was to be discussed in the trial, which began on January 5, 2015. The case resulted in a mistrial in May 2015 due to a hung jury, which was deadlocked 11 against, 1 for conviction. A retrial began on October 19, 2016 in the New York City court, with jury deliberations in February 2017. On February 4, 2017, Hernandez was found guilty of kidnapping and felony murder. Sentencing was scheduled on February 28, with Hernandez facing up to 25 years to life in prison. However, Hernandez's attorneys were granted a delay 
so as to be able to challenge the verdict, and no new sentencing date was set. On April 28, 2017, Hernandez was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after serving at least 25 years. Stan and Julie Patz had the 2004 judgment against Ramos dismissed after the 2015 trial of Pedro Hernandez convinced them that Ramos was not responsible for their son's death. The extensive media attention given to Eaton's disappearance has been credited with creating greater attention to missing children, resulting in changes such as less willingness to allow children to walk to school, photos of missing children being printed on milk cartons, and promotion of the concept of stranger danger. The idea that all adults not known to the child must be regarded as potential sources of danger. Thank you.